Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Virtual Bedtime Stories from your very own Newark Public Library. Um, as always, we are recording this live story stream on land that rightfully belongs to the Lenape Indians. And if you're tuning in from anywhere in our fair city of Newark, New Jersey tonight, you are probably also on land that rightfully belongs to that Indian tribe. I am your host, Mix Alley, Mix just like mixing bowl, not to be confused with Mr., Ms., Mrs., or Miss, because as you can see, I am not a boy nor a girl. I'm a unicorn and I am ready for bed. Uh, how about you, my dear storytelling companion, Jonathan Van Unicorn? Oh, oh yes, I, I think I'm ready for bed too. I've had a very long day of writing what is sure to be a great, great novel, a best-selling bildungsroman, My Father's Unicorn. Oh yes, Jonathan, you were a little upset when you found out that for story time today, uh, earlier uh, at 2 p.m., we were reading the book, My Father's Dragon. Yes, I, I think a book called My Father's Unicorn needs to be written, and that needs to be what people read more often than this My Father's Dragon nonsense. I mean, dragons are fine. Yes, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, tomorrow is Taco Tuesday, so I imagine we'll be reading all about how dragons love tacos, and, and that's going to be all right, certainly. But, you know, Mick Sally. You're a unicorn, I'm a unicorn. We all understand that unicorn stories are very important. So I've been working very busily to contribute the story, My Father's Unicorn, to the unicorn literary canon. And now, oh my, oh, oh, I think I'm about ready for bed. Well, Jonathan, you have come to the right place, as we always do um, during our virtual bedtime stories. We are going to read a bedtime story, and we're going to get real restful with some uh, bedtime yoga, and then it's going to be time to get tucked in and go to sleep. How's that sound? Oh, yes, that, that seems just fine. Oh, oh I'll, I'll just go over here, and I'll uh, get very cozy and certainly not fall asleep while you're reading. And, and and just listen to our bedtime story. Okay, Jonathan, that sounds good to me. All right, folks. Well, well our, uh, our first story of the evening before we read our good night yoga story um, is going to be another story from this book we've been reading, 10 in a Bed by Alan Alberg and Andre Armstutz. And um, those of you who have been on hand for past virtual bedtimes may remember that um, what always happens in these stories is that a little girl named Dinah Price tries very hard to go to bed at her normal bedtime, just like her parents said to you, but she is always thwarted by someone in her bed who does not belong there and will not leave without a bedtime story. So we'll see who Dinah Price, the heroine of these stories, discovers in her bed this time, and how she gets them to clear up her bed so that she can get a good night's rest. Um, this is chapter three. It's called The Clockwork Mouse. Have you seen a clockwork mouse before? Here's what they look like. It's a kind of an old-fashioned toy. They're lots of fun. What happens is that you wind up that, that little key that you see at the top, and then the mouse rolls around on the floor, uh, kind of like a toy car. All right. Get cozy and get ready to listen. Here, my dear friends, is The Clockwork Mouse, a chapter from Ten in a Bed by Alan Alberg. The next day, this is the day after the last time that we met Dinah, and that time she had a wicked witch in her bed. Before that, she had the three bears in her bed. The next day, Dinah Price got up, got dressed, and had her breakfast. She had cornflakes with the top of the milk on them, a piece of bread and butter dipped in her dad's boiled egg, 
a cup of tea and an orange. She told her dad about the Wicked Witch. He said that that was very interesting. Her mom said that it was very interesting too. Now we know what all the noise was, her mom said. On her way to school, Dinah told her friend about the Wicked Witch. Her friend said she had had a wicked wizard in her bed one time. At school, Dinah made a model of the witch out of an egg box. Her teacher, Mrs. Hicks, said it was very nice, dear. She put it on the interest table with a label saying what it was and who had made it. The school dinner was steak and kidney pie, carrots and gravy, treacle cart, treacle tart, and custard. In the afternoon, a boy in Dinah's class brought some frogs to school. They were baby frogs. He had them in a little plastic bucket. Mrs. Hicks let everybody see the frogs. Some of the children wrote about them in their news books. When the bucket got knocked over, Dinah fetched them off. After school, Dinah went to the shop for her mom. She fetched a bag of sugar, a packet of frozen peas, and a lolly. She had her tea and played with her baby brother in the garden. She wanted to play with her big brother in the park, but he was going with his friends and he wouldn't take her. When bedtime came, Dinah Price kissed her mom and dad goodnight, asked if she could watch a teeny bit of the program they were watching, watched a little of it, climbed the stairs, went to her room, and found a cat in her bed. This cat was sitting up in the bed like a human being. He was turning the key in a clockwork mouse. He had a hat with a feather in it beside him on the bed and a violin case. Dinah sat down on her stool. Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, she said. Is that you? Used to be, said the cat, but I have since gone on to better things. He smoothed the bedclothes and released the mouse. With occasional stops and starts, it scuttled round in a circle. From time to time, the cat batted it with its paw. Here's what this cat looked like in Dinah's bed. Here is Dinah, very surprised to find him there. There's not much of a part for an ambitious cat in Hey Diddle Diddle, you know. I never thought of that, said Dinah. The dish and the spoon have the best of it. Well, the dish does. The cat reached for the mouse and began rewinding it. There again, ding dong bell, pussy's in the well is even worse. Were you the pussy in the well as well? In earlier years, said the cat, though, I was a little more than a kitten then. Have you been lots of cats? Oh, lots. Big parts, mostly. Though lately, as I say, things are looking up. Once more, the cat released the clockwork mouse. Dinah watched it go bumpily over the bedclothes. The cat watched Dinah. Do you like that mouse? Yes, said Dinah. Do you write to business? Do you want to buy it? I haven't got any money. Dinah said. I guessed as much. Do you want to swap for it? Dinah knew she was not supposed to swap for things. She sometimes got into trouble for that. All the same, she said, what could I swap? Well, the cat glanced casually around the bedroom. In this part I have now, what I'm most in need of is a fish. Dinah followed the direction of the cat's gaze. He was looking at the goldfish tank. Oh no, not my goldfish, because the cat would probably eat the goldfish. Besides, I've just thought I'm not supposed to swap for things. Ah, that's too bad. The cat opened the violin case, took out a second clockwork mouse, and set it going after the first. Could I tempt you with two of them? Uh, no, Dinah said. Pity, 
The cat leaned forward and batted one of the mice. Not to worry. I'll think of something. For a moment, there was silence. Dinah, too, was thinking. She said, Would you really eat my goldfish if you could? Raw? No, the cat shook his head. I prefer blackbirds, baked in a pie. No, the fish isn't for me. It's for the king. You see, in this part I have, I need... What is the part? said Dinah. And the cat said, guess. So then Dinah tried to guess what part the cat was playing. Well, I don't think you're a witch's cat, she said. You don't act like one. You aren't the crooked cat that the crooked man bought with his crooked sixpence, either. What others are there? I know. Maybe you're the one in the owl and the pussycat. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. Nah, said the cat, that's not me. I remember being offered the part, but I turned it down. Who wants to marry an owl? I never thought of that, said Dinah. Once more, there was silence. Dinah tried to think of other cats she had heard of. The one in her bed twiddled with his whiskers and gazed thoughtfully around him. Through the open window came the sound of a car door slamming. There was the faint snip-snip of garden shears, which was Dinah's mum cutting the hedge. The cat said, Look, since we're short of time, I'll give you a clue. He reached for the hat with the feather in it, and with a flourish, placed it on his head. Any good? Dinah thought for a minute. No? Right. Here's another clue. With these words, the cat stuck one of his back feet out at the side of the bed, and the foot, as perhaps Dinah should have guessed, had a boot on it. Oh, said Dinah, you're puss in boots. That's it. You got it. The cat took his hat off again and batted the feather with his paw. Puss in boots, sometimes called the master cat. It's a star part, you see. I do, said Dinah. Oh, yes. So now you know why I need the fish. Well... I've heard the story, said Dinah. Mrs. Hicks told it to us, but I'm not sure I remember a fish being in it. You should. The fish is crucial. You see, there's this old miller and he dies and he leaves his youngest son a cat. I remember that, said Dinah. Well, this young fellow is fed up with only being left a cat. But of course, it isn't any old cat. It's Puss in Boots. Anyway, Puss in Boots is very clever. He has this idea to make the youngest son rich. When What he does is he goes out, catches a fish, and carries it to the king. He says it is a present for the king from his master, the Lord Marquis of Carabas, which is a name he just made up, you see, for the youngest son. I remember that as well, Dinah said. Yes, what he says is, at this point, the cat leapt from the bed and struck a dramatic pose on the bedside rug. What he says is, my Lord Marquis of Carabas, your majesty's most humble servant, craves your indulgence and with all due respects, sends you this fish. The cat made a flourish with his hat and bowed low to Dinah. Then, pretending she was the king, he mimed the presentation of the fish to her. Dinah mimed the acceptance of it and clapped her hands. That's very good. Oh, I know my lines. The cat purred briefly and twiddled with his whiskers. Anyway, you remember the rest. Puss in Boots takes other gifts to the king and, this way and that, fixes it up for the youngest son to marry his daughter. Even gets him a castle, too. Yes, said Dinah, I remember. And it's an ogre's castle, isn't it? It is. That's the tricky bit. Still, it's in the script, so what can you do? The cat gave each of his boots a tug. They had floppy tops and were a little too big for him. Anyway, that's why I need the fish. No fish, no story. Trouble is, 
fishing's not a sport I'm any good at. Now the cat was getting ready to leave. He opened the violin case and put the clockwork mice in it. Dinah wondered how many more he had in there. The cat said, I've just thought. You've never told me your name. It's Dinah Price, said Dinah. Well, Dinah Price, it's been a pleasure meeting you. If I wasn't so concerned about this fish, I'd stay and talk some more. You speak your lines very nicely. Thank you, said Dinah. She had never thought she was speaking lines before. The cat adjusted his hat in the dressing table mirror. It was darker in the room now, but there was still light for him to see by. He said, this part seems to suit you. What other parts have you had? Dinah frowned. She had never thought she was playing a part either. She said, I was in the school play at Christmas. It was the nativity. Nativity? Is there a part for a cat in that? Not really, said Dinah. It's about the baby Jesus. Ah, and who were you? I was the shepherd's little girl. The shepherds watched their flocks by night. I had to take him his supper wrapped in a cloth. Did you have any lines? Yes, but I don't remember them now. I remember mine, said the cat, every one of them, even the first. He stepped over to the window, stood on the toy box and peered out. Yes, my first lines were in the three little kittens. You know, they lost their mittens and all that. Oh, I know, said Dinah. Let's see, how did it go? Oh, mother dear, we sadly fear our mittens we have lost. And Dinah said, what? Lost your kit mittens? You naughty kittens, then you shall have no pie. And the cat said, meow, 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 meow. After that, he looked out of the window again. Do you have far to go? said Dinah. Not too far, said the cat. I know a shortcut. Will you go down the drain pipe? Not if I can help it. Then the cat said, there's a woman out there trimming a hedge. That's my mum, said Dinah. There's a man in green overalls unpegging nappies from a line, and there's a dog watching him. That's my dad and my dog. Right, said the cat. Should we clear downstairs then? Have you got a cat door? No, said Dinah. Not to worry. Maybe the kitchen window's open. I'll take a look. The cat left his hat and violin case on the bed and stepped out of the room. Dinah remained on her stool. She leaned forward and flicked at the handle of the violin case. She thought about the cat being in bed with his boots on and what her mum would say to that. She also thought about the fish. When the cat returned, he said, that's lucky, the back door's open. He reached for his hat. Dinah said, I've been thinking about the fish. Wouldn't fish fingers do? Hardly, said the cat. Well, does it have to be a fish at all? I suppose not. I think it was a rabbit in one version, but that's no help to me. I can't catch them either. What about a mouse then? Might manage that, said the cat, though I doubt if the king would thank me for it. Just then, Dinah had an idea. What about a clockwork mouse? He'd thank you for that. Do you think so? The cat twiddled with his whiskers. It's not in the script, but there again, neither were goldfish. That's what I was going to say, said Dinah. Yes. The cat batted at the tasseled cord of Dinah's dressing gown, which was hanging behind the door. You know, I believe you're on to something. I'll do it. With these words, the cat once more removed a clockwork mouse from his violin case. Then he bowed low to Dinah again and made a flourish with his hat. My Lord Marquis of Carabas, your majesty's most humble slave craves your indulgence and with all due respect sends you this clockwork mouse. And Dinah said, how very nice, how pretty. You must marry my daughter at once. 
No, 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 not me, said the cat. I'm the cat. What you say is... He put out a paw. Reluctantly, Dinah handed back the mouse she'd been presented with. What you say is... Have you got lots of clockwork mice in there, said Dinah. Lots, said the cat. There's some sugar mice as well. Really? Yes, look, and chocolate ones. So there are, said Dinah. What else is in there, said the cat. Let's see, I've got a mouse balloon in here, I seem to remember. Mouse glove puppet, pencil sharpener, party squeaker. Only thing I'm short of is a violin. Violin case with all kinds of mouse toys, but no violin. The cat put his hat on again and closed the violin case. Anyway, I'd best be off. I might just reach the palace before the king has his supper. He went over to the window. Shall I shut this window and pull the curtains across? Yes, please, said Dinah. Right. Now then, you get into bed and I'll tuck you in. Dinah did as she was told. It was really quite dark in the room now. The cat was no more than a shadow. Only his eyes gleamed. The cat said, one last thing. What's your favorite? Sugar or chocolate? Chocolate. No, sugar, Dinah said. After that, the cat placed into Dinah's hand a sugar mouse, said thank you very much for all your help, closed the door, went down the stairs, out of the house, up the street, and away. Dinah Price lay in the bed and sucked her sugar mouse. When it got small, she tucked it into her cheek to make it last longer. When it was gone, she suddenly wished she'd saved it. I could have shown it to my friend, she said to herself. After that, she closed her eyes and slept until morning. And that is the end of that chapter. Uh, next week, um, we will have another virtual bedtime story. Uh, same time, 7 p.m. Uh, on Monday. Um, but for now, it is time for most of us to sleep until morning as well. So let's close out with some good night yoga. Um, now, particularly for those of you who have not joined us for bedtime yoga before, let's make sure that we warm up a little bit first. The whole point of yoga is to make sure that your body feels really good and relaxed um, no matter what you're doing, but in this case before you go to bed at night. Um, if you like the way that this feels, you could do it at other times during the day as well. But what's most important is to take really nice, deep, juicy breaths. So we're going to practice that together. We're going to do one deep breath in, Hold that breath and let it out. Let's do three breaths like that. If, like me, you already feel a little bit more peaceful just from taking those three breaths, remember that taking breaths like that is something you can do any time that you feel stressed or worried um, or agitated during the day. You can always that can really help to make you feel better. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, we're going to do a few poses together, a few different yoga positions that are going to tell a bedtime story. And it doesn't matter a ton if you get those poses exactly right. What matters most, <coughs> excuse me, what matters most is the posture that you have while you're trying out these yoga moves. So the most important thing will be to keep your head right over your heart and your heart right over your hips. Imagine you've got one, two, three 
beautiful shining stars and you want them to be all in a line together. Let's make sure we've got that right. Do one more breath. All right, and now we are all warmed up and ready for some good night yoga. The good night yoga book, a pose by pose bedtime story is by Miriam Gates and illustrated by Sarah Jane Hinder. And I'm going to be reading you the book and also pausing to show you what each pose looks like. But if you can tell what it should look like just from the pictures in the book, go ahead and do it yourself. The sun in the sky is going down. And here's what our first pose is going to look like. So we're going to stand up. And just like the person in the picture, we're going to raise up our arms. As I breathe in, and as I breathe out, my arms lift up to the sky and then back down like sun rays. And the clouds float by. Ooh, so this is gonna be our next one. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, I bend my knees and scoop the clouds around me. When I breathe out, I release the clouds over my head. Let's try it out. Mm, let's do that one again. Bring those clouds in. <laughs> and let them out. <laughs> My apologies, folks. There we go. My camera was not made for yoga. The stars sparkle brightly. All right, there's our next pose. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, my arms reach out wide toward the stars. And we're all shaped like stars now too, huh? If you're ever ahead of me, or if you ever want to stay in a pose a little longer, that is totally okay. Just keep doing those nice juicy breaths. That's what matters the most. Ooh, the moon rises high. There's our next pose. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, my spine is long. Let's bring our feet together. And I bend to each side like a crescent moon. My hands are touching the ceiling when I try to be the moon in my room. The birds are flying back now. Oh, folks, we're going to be birds. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, I focus on one point, lift my leg, and use my arms to soar. Let's try that together. The 
the birds fly to their homes in the trees. Ooh, we're gonna try standing on one leg next. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, my shoulders roll back, my heart is open and I am solid like a tree. Ooh, the ladybugs settle softly. We're gonna be ladybugs next. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, my palms press together as I squat down on my leaf. All right, we're gonna be back on the floor for this one if you're not already. Here we have some butterflies. We're gonna sit just like this. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, my feet press together and my knees spread out like butterfly wings. Have you ever sat like a butterfly before? A lot of us probably have. Ooh, and we've also got some bees. As I breathe in, I sit up tall and reach my arms back like wings. As I breathe out, I buzz my head down to the ground. Okay, let's try that. There's a little blue cat who lives in the moon. Ooh, we're gonna be on all fours like a kitty cat for this one. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, I arch my back like a cat. And that little blue cat says to us, Good night, world. You'll be dreaming soon. Here's our last one. As I breathe in, as I breathe out, I sit back on my heels, still and round like the earth. Two more nice deep breaths. All right. I hope you are feeling so peaceful and ready for the sweetest dreams. We'll see you back here with more stories tomorrow morning. Good night.